when we say that there's only two types of movement or two types of change possible, the spontaneous type and the directed type. This is another way of talking about um, the via erratum and the via veritas. So it's putting it in a different way. So the via erratum, according to the alchemists, is where we try to save ourselves by our own efforts. And that's what we all do because we don't have we don't have any faith that anything else is going to help us. And by that I don't mean other people. Because it's the via for artists is not about trying to get other people to help us. It's about seeing what happens when we don't try to help ourselves or when we don't get anyone else to try and help us when we don't try and buy into any helping activity whatsoever. When the alchemists spoke of it, it was clearly in a religious way, using the word religious in a fairly broad way, you could say, a mystical way maybe. So the via veratis is when we are saved by God's grace using that language but it helps to although it helps to understand what the alchemists are saying or at least to know what they're saying it also helps to have different ways of looking at this as well and the great thing about looking at the dichotomy of directed change versus spontaneous change is that there's no metaphysical bag baggage As I was saying in the last video, we don't need to invoke a higher power. Were we to invoke a higher power, that would be our thinking. We'd be thinking, ah, there's a higher power. Now that thought is not a higher power, that thought is a thought about a higher power. And having a thought about a higher power is exactly the same as having a thought about anything else under the sun. I could be having a thought about um, whether I should mow the lawn or not, whether um, there's a scratch on the bodywork of my car, whether I should day take the day off work, um, whether there's such a thing as aliens, etc., etc. These are all thoughts. And when there's no thought, when there's no thought being involved, then there's no need to label what's happening and say it's a higher power or say anything like that. As soon as we say anything like that, we try to draw everything into our net, our net of knowing by which we know what's going on and feel comfortable on that basis. But that type of comfort is, is, is false because we don't really know. We just lull ourselves into the false security of thinking we know when we don't at all. So spontaneous change has no taint of metaphysics. You don't need to buy into any scheme of things whether it's God or cosmic consciousness or whatever the hell. That's all just nonsense. Spontaneous change is change that just happens. Of course, the thinking mind likes to say why it happens, what, talk about it and say, what, say stuff about it. But there's no need for that. That's just getting in the way. If something happens, then something happens. It's not my department. It's not for me to analyze and label and that's just creating attachments. So in the last um, video, I was saying that directed versus spontaneous change relates to change that happens inside of us, how 
our psyche changes. Does it change because I've told it to change? Or instructed it to change or somehow coerced it to change? Or does it change because for reasons best known to itself, it just changes? And it, and it most certainly is possible to modify the psyche, make it more artificial, um, hem it in with our ideas and assumptions. It's perfectly possible because it's what we always do. But that comes under the category of reinventing ourselves. We can reinvent ourselves over and over again if we've got the energy and the um, inspiration or the, the ideas of what we want to invent ourselves to be. So that's directed change. And that's like, that's the same as playing games. I can play the game that I'm this, I can play the game that I'm that, but it is just a game. Because when I stop um, doing it, that's the end of it. It's my own doing. It is dependent upon my own effort. So you can say that the, the everyday sense of self is a doing. I'm, I maintain it. I'm frightened not to maintain it. Because if I can't maintain my sense of self, my sense of who I am, if I can't maintain my image, that is um, very, very stressful because the image is all I've got. If the image gets tattered and falls to pieces or gets big holes in it, what else is there? All there is is a tattered image as far as I'm concerned because I don't know anything else. So even though my self-image might be not so great, it might be kind of um, pretty third rate, it might be pretty crappy, but it's all I've got, so I need to maintain it. I mean, I need to hang on to it. So this hanging on to our idea of ourselves is what lies behind the game, the game playing. It's not like voluntary game playing, as in let's play a game because that could be fun. It's more like I have to keep on playing this game because I'm frightened of what might happen if I don't. Only I don't say it's a game because as soon as I actually see it as a game, that's the end of the game. So I never s say that it is a game or see it as a game. But all that stuff is directed change. We're familiar with directed change. If I got an awful lot of um, willpower and energy, I could probably do a lot with that directed change. But it doesn't count for anything because it's real. Not real, because it's um, because it's an act. I can be a brilliant actor. That doesn't mean I create the character that I act, because it is an act. And an image is just an image, so no matter how flawless and spotless, because we, on the whole, we, we put a lot of effort into that, and we can get we can get pretty good we can get a pretty good image going. We can get a pretty shiny, pretty flawless, pretty immaculate image. But it's only an image. So that is the whole realm of directed change. Spontaneous change, as I've said, it has no. There's no need to take any metaphysical baggage on board. And if we do, actually, that's a disaster for us anyway. Who wants metaphysical baggage? Who wants to be weighed down with a bunch of crap? But the other side of that is, if we say, well, if we're not justifying it or explaining it, how do we know that it exists? What rationale have we got? What theories have we got? What research possibly has gone into it? And that's all just baggage as well, because none of it is relevant, because there's nothing, there's no way to experimentally prove spontaneous change, I don't think, from a psychological point of view. And there'd be no point in trying anyway. <clears throat> but what we can do is see it. So never mind theories and all the rest of it. If anyone wanted to notice spontaneous change, 
all they would have to do is be quiet for a while and see what happens. And what happens is, what happens next? What happens next is we drift. Maybe drifting is the wrong word, but we we move. So what we move away from is our baseline of who we understand ourselves to be and what we understand the world to be. So that's like um, a static kind of a thing. It's like a, I understand a bookcase to be a bookcase. That's all there is to it. Um, it's just a bookcase, so that's a static um, fixture. It's unremarkable. It's kind of boring because who's going to want to kind of um, keep thinking about it because there's nothing new in it. And, and then that same thing is true for us. We've turned ourselves into a static fixture. We've turned the world into a static fixture. Our thoughts have done that. Thoughts only ever deal in static fixtures. But if I stay still for a while, still meaning not frantically thinking all the time and being totally engrossed in my own thinking, I can notice this movement, this drift. Um, there's a movement away from the equilibrium point. The equilibrium point is what we've said everything is. And then having said what it is, we ignore it because it's kind of boring then and just get on with other stuff on the strength of, on the basis of what we've said it is. And because we're acting on the basis of the um, image of ourselves or the image of the world, that means we attention is directed the other way. And so th th this picture we have becomes pragmatically true because we're acting out of it as if it were true the whole time without ever questioning it. So it becomes pragmatically true. And the busier I get, the more I reify that picture. The more purposeful activity I engage in, the more I reify the idea of the purposeful self. So on the one hand, I've got all my endeavours, my rational, purposeful endeavours. I'm stretching out to try and do stuff. But all of those rational, purposeful endeavours come out of this stick in the mud, this kind of big lump of concrete or whatever that just stays the same. And that is my assumed um, idea of the world or idea of myself. So that we can never get beyond that. And so anything I do on the basis of that is just mere window dressing. It's nothing really. It's like one of those cartoons where a character is running and running and running without realising they're on the end of an elastic band. And they're running frantically for a while and they suddenly they stop running or they stop moving and they're still running and next thing they snap back. So that self-image, that equilibrium value is what we're attached to with an elastic band. And if we really put a lot of effort into it, we can have the illusion that we're escaping that we're getting somewhere. But as we know from all of those cartoons, you don't get anywhere, you just think you are because you're a bit of an idiot and you think, yeah, look at me, I'm getting somewhere. And then we snap back again. So anything we do on the basis of um, our equilibrium understanding of who we are and what things are is like that. And what's even more, what's even worse is the fact that that post to which we are tethered, like a horse outside a saloon being tethered to a wooden post, isn't real anywhere because we only assumed it. We just said, Look, let's take this for granted and act as if it's true. And then we start acting as if it's true. And when we start acting as if it's true, we lose the ability to question it and know that it isn't true. But it isn't true. We only create it with our unreflective purposeful action or unreflective rational thinking. So by thinking the whole time and being busy the whole time, we reify an unreal thing and then we're tethered to it. Which means that all um, our ideas of getting somewhere are just that, they're just ideas. So it's inherently a frustrating situation, we could say, but we don't genuinely see it to be frustrating because in our fantasies, we're getting somewhere. And even when we get knocked back again, it's like, well, next time I'll get somewhere. 
and we carry on like that, and that is conditioned existence. That really does sum up everything we need to know about it. We can't get anywhere on the basis of who we think we are. And we can't improve ourselves on the basis of who we think we are because there's no improvement. It's just me attached by an elastic band to some solid structure, running like crazy, thinking I'm getting somewhere. That's my self-improvement. That's what all self-improvement is that. How could it be anything different? What am I trying to improve? The unexamined idea that I have of myself. So, all purposeful activity is got this quality of apparently getting away, apparently getting escape velocity, apparently doing something real, when actually that then um, the fact of the matter is that that isn't true at all. So that's purposeful activity. So that's why we can say that directed change in the psychological sphere of things is not the way to go. Because directed change is always tethered to the unexamined idea we have of ourselves in the world, etc., etc., etc. Then the other type of change, we can see it. Because if we sit, sit still for a while, we will notice that things get ever so slightly strange. We're actually moving in the direction of increased strangeness. Because the equilibrium view of things isn't being reinforced because we're staying still. And the only reason we seem to be what the unremarkable kind of way that we normally are, the predictable and concrete way that we normally are, is because we work hard at keeping ourselves there with the busyness. That's why it's so important to be busy. When we stop being busy, traditionally everyone will say, well, that's no good because you're being lazy. What the hell are you doing anyway? You could be doing all sorts of useful stuff. You could have a whole list of things to do and you could be doing them and then you'd have the satisfaction of having done all the things on your list. And there you are just sitting there doing nothing. But actually, of course, doing nothing means that we're not keeping ourselves frozen into this unreal position and we're actually actually starting to perceive things not through thought so much but through something else, through, through an awareness of just what it feels like to be here or to be sitting here or so it's a much more direct thing, it's like drinking a glass of orange juice and we notice the flavour it's not a, there's no cognitive processing going on, there's no comparison, it's just a very direct, it's just a very direct perception without the, without the thinking mind getting involved and telling us what it means. Because we don't care what it means, it just is a flavour, it's, it's a flavour, it's a flavour of orange juice. If we think about it, it means um, we will I won't enjoy the, we miss the whole point. It's like analysing a joke too much. If we analyse jokes, yeah, we, we're not going to really be getting the jokes. So it's a lot more direct. And when we are just directly being, we can say that things get progressively stranger just feels not so familiar, not so stale, not so stagnant. It's like we quickly, fairly quickly, get to the point where we don't recognise anything because there's nothing to compare anything with. There's no fixed framework to keep referencing things to because we've given up the activity of referencing everything to a fixed framework. So we're moving. We're moving in the direction of disequilibrium. 
we're moving in the direction of increasing strangeness or increasing wholeness. Because the more I can perceive things to be a whole, the stranger things get. Or the less standardised, the less regular, the less boring, the less concrete things get. So things always are a whole, but, but the activity of thought keeps us fragmented because that's what thought does, it fragments. It fights against the, the view of things as being a whole, a whole. Um, Stan Groff talks about the holotropic force and the holotropic force. So holotropic is that force or the inclination that takes us towards being more whole. And the holotropic direction, the holotropic force takes us in the direction of the fragment. It fragments us, it takes us back into, into the equilibrium world, into our thoughts. So, it is a matter of perception. If we were interested, we could experience that type of movement, that type of change. When we're talking within the terms of therapy, we can see that that's very, very difficult to do because the way things are right now are painful, is painful. And so my natural inclination is to purposefully strive to free myself from that pain, to get away from that pain. I want to do the thing that will help me get away from that pain. But even though doing the thing that can help me get away that, from that pain can seem to work for a while, it is an elastic band. So essentially what we're talking about is distraction. And even to this day, in psychiatric hospitals, we are still exhorted to distract ourselves. In other words, kid ourselves that we're getting away from it, only to have that false sense of security shattered and come back with that um, Come back in a painful way to the reality, time and time again, which hurts. It's futile escaping. We can allow ourselves to believe that we're escaping for a while and then we discover we're not and that's dysphoric. So the euphoria of thinking we're escaping is very, um, very well compensated for by the pain and despair, hopelessness of discovering that we're not. And of course, because we believe that purposeful action is the only way we can escape, when we discover that purposeful action of any sort doesn't help us escape, we think that's it, we're finished. There's no hope for us, we're stuck forever. But that is simply because we don't know about the other type of change, the other type of movement, which is what Krishnamurti calls the movement away from the known. Thanks for watching.